Washington is playing for a national championship. It's time for some keys to the game. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back in to another edition of the Lockdown Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. We write for Inside the Huskies of Fan Nation Sports Illustrated. You can check out all our written work over there at si.com slash college slash Washington. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen of the day. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that can treat 50 plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. All right, Lars. So everybody knows why we're here. Washington is playing for a national championship today as the everydayers are so listening to this on Monday. So we're just going to jump right into it here. Offensive keys against Michigan, who has one of the best defenses in the country. This is going to be a heavyweight battle, but I, I think Washington's offense deserves a little bit more credit than I feel like some in the, in, especially when, you know, all the Michigan fans in our comments seem to be wanting to give them. Yeah, and I mean, I think the coincidence being, well, who was the who was the, who was the Joe Moore Award winner the last two years? It was Michigan. Now right. it's Washington. So I think that's where this game is going to be won and lost for either team, right? Because if Michigan is able to get Penix off his mark and you know not make this a shootout, that means they have to get pressure, and it means the offensive line would struggle, right? If you're if you're if you're Washington, yeah. right? And in order for again. Now it's the Washington-centric podcast. So for Washington to win this game or to be in a position to win this game, Penix can't be sacked more than, what, three times? Because, again, I'd say probably, two. Yeah, two, two or three. I mean, three kind of being friendly, but certainly two, right? Because that's kind of where he's been. He got sacked twice against – at least once or twice against Oregon in the Pac-12 championship. But still, it was twice in that game, yeah. Okay, so that, that, that's why I kind of threw a third in. Because I could, I, could, I could see a third and still get away with the twos being a little bit better. But yeah, you have Pedix has to be on, not on point, but he, he if sure. he's off his game and if Michigan is getting consistent pressure on him, Washington's going to be playing from behind in this game. So this everything, because again, the offensive line sets up the run game, sets up the passing game, kind of dictates the tempo of the game. That to me is where Washington, especially in the first half, is what's going to stand out to me in determining, in determining who's actually going to win this game. Right. So then, because that all comes back to two guys that, that I feel like we can start this off with. Michael Penix, as, as you just talked about, and then Dylan Johnson, where what's his health going to look like? He said he's healthy. He said he's ready to go and that he's going to play. It sounds like he's going to end up playing a lot. Um, but what is that going to look like? Because you talked about the offensive line. And Michigan's run defense has been okay. They're, they're, they've been pretty good. They're, they haven't been you know as elite as the pass defense, I would say, if you want to just kind of compare it that way. But I think that if Dylan Johnson can find a way to establish himself, like we've seen him do so many times this season, that that's going to be really big for this Husky offense, where that's going to open up so many things. And then we've already seen what Washington's passing offense can do to even some of the best secondaries. And we saw what they did to Oregon. We've we've seen that they can pick apart good teams and good defenses. And, you know, I, I again, I, I feel like it's it's the same point here, but I have no reason to believe that they can't do it again, even against a very, very good Michigan secondary, because we've seen them do that so many times this season, where especially when, if we see the Michael Penix that we saw in the sugar bowl, there, there isn't a defensive back in the country that can stop what he can do when he's throwing the ball to Roma dude say, when he can get in there to Jalen Polk, Jalen McMillan, everything that he wants to do, he could just do whatever he wanted. And I wouldn't be surprised if he found a way to do that again, because He's shown, just like this whole team has all year, that they are built for these big moments and they are prepared when they come up. Exactly. And I think the other thing to consider is, you know, knowing Will Johnson, Michigan's corner, best best cornerback is going to go against Robert Dunze. This matchup, to your point, now is Penix predicated upon his third and fourth read, right? And plus Dylan sure. Johnson, right? Because it's all it's, in this Washington offense, somebody is always open. It's, on, it's going to be on Michael Penix to not get flustered by the pass rush, to have time in the pocket to throw, or even you know, get out of the pocket if you need, and find those third and fourth options. Because, again, Rome's going to get his targets, right? Rome's going to have his game, much like Jalen Polk and Jalen McMahon. But it's going to become those key, you know, when it's a, a check down to Jack West over that game, 13 yards for third down, where 
again, yes, you would like to get the ball to Paul McMillan and Ajunze on every single play, but that's why you have the Jack Westovers, the Devin Culps of the world, you know, maybe even sure. Dylan Johnson check down to Jeremy Bernard, another kind of example is if, and Giles Jackson, you know, you're kind of fifth and sixth options to where those, those guys can probably combine <laughs> to like say seven or eight plays slash catches. And those small yard totals will actually be just as imperative as whatever Polk McMillan and Adunze finish with, because this game is going to be so finite in terms of what's going to separate the game. Those few plays will either extend a drive or set Washington back, and that's what's going to determine the game. Right. So, and I, I think just to just to just elaborate a little bit more there, who's one guy who we've seen in so many clutch situations that has just made play after play for this team? It's Jack Westover. Yeah. Where that's one guy where Michigan's got a fantastic set of linebackers, and they're they're this this whole team is really good in pass coverage. I really like the scheme that they've got going on, but. Jack Westover has just found ways to make plays in, in tough scenarios. And the same can be said for everybody along Washington's offense. And I don't know. It's just, it's one thing where we look at, cause it's, it's best on best, which is exactly what you want in the national championship. The number one passing offense versus the number one passing defense. And that's awesome. That's exactly what we could have asked for. I know I just said that, but it's that exciting. It's that fun to watch. And I just I see no reason to bet against Washington's offense at this point because of the tests they face from everything that they have found a way to overcome this season. And just Roma Dunze, I think that Will Johnson's gonna get a couple of his, but Roma Dunze is gonna get some back. And then outside of that, it's just who is just exactly like you said, who is going to step up and be that number two? I'm really curious. I think it's going to be a big Jalen Polk day because we saw what he was able to do in, in the Sugar Bowl. And I wouldn't be surprised if he can find a way to have a similar performance where, you know, after we saw him struggle for a couple of weeks with drops and everything, he's found a way to come back to be the sure-handed, just reliable receiver we know him to be over the middle. And if, you know, you can stretch the defense out a little bit, then maybe you can sprinkle in a little bit more Dylan Johnson, which is something that we know Ryan Grubb isn't afraid to do in moments like this where he's willing to lean on him. And it's it's kind of out the window at this point where if he's even at 80, 85%, I wouldn't be surprised if he finds a way to get 20 carries in this game. Exactly. I think it's more or less just a matter of maybe not having back-to-back runs for Dylan. Like, you know, okay, like you say you get first down, you get six yards, four yards. Then you probably go to a couple of passes, and then you get Dylan back. Because they, right. they're not – because, you know, if – you know, you don't want what happens – what happened to Jalen McMillan to happen to Dylan Johnson where it comes in for like a first series or two, isn't able to go. So now you're – because you maybe put a lot of, you know, sure. calls on him early, right? And I think – unless you're getting behind the sticks, you almost want Dylan Johnson to be that compliment to where, hey, it's third and three. We've only given you the ball once on this drive. You should be able to get this, right? And depending on where they are on the field, it could even be four down territory. So I think that's all – Dylan Johnson doesn't have to have the USC game or anywhere near it, right? He probably doesn't even have to get to 100 yards. Again, it would be great if he did. But if you could get Dylan Johnson to what seventy yards and two touchdowns, I think you take that because that's similar to what he had in the in the Sugar Bowl, and that's basically for this offense all you need is just that sixty forty element of a run. You don't have to be getting total chunk yardage every single play when it comes to running the ball. You don't need because again, this Dylan Johnson is not going to be in that seven, eight, nine yards per carry range, right? Even even a limited. Oh, absolutely, right? yeah. Right, even a limited number. So it's just a matter of can you make it effective? That's that I think is the key word for Rush, Washington's run game is effective. Like when yep. we are going to decide to not use the left arm of the golden god Michael Penix, <laughs> you got to get what you got to get on the ground. You can't we we can't be going three rate three three straight runs when we get six yards. Like that that's not going to work because those that singular drive is now one that you're not going to be able to get back, and now you start to chase the game. So every single play matters. No, you're you're absolutely right. So, I feel like that's a good point to just kind of switch switch from the offense to defense. You ready for the defense? Yep. 
We're going to send a shout out to our friends over at FanDuel. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get 150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use. There's so many different ways to bet, like live same game parlays. You can find bets in the new Explore tab. You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel is an official partner of the NFL. And just a reminder to all Husky fans out there, Washington, still four and a half point underdogs. I feel like that's, you know, just been a theme of the last couple of weeks with this team. So if you, if you feel the need to throw some money on that that side, we, we wouldn't discourage you. All right, Lars, let's move on to the defensive side here. So the first key we know is going to be stopping the run. Michigan loves to extend drives, hold on to the ball for a while, and just ride Blake Corum for as long as they possibly can. And he's been a horse for him this season. He's scored 25 touchdowns on the ground. He's had a fantastic year. There's no denying any of that. But how can Washington stop him or contain him it would, be, would be the best best question. Well, so, so ironically, I've been asked that. You know, that's kind of been one of the obviously main themes, main questions of the, the lead up to this game. And one thing that's really stood out, and people have mentioned this to me, you know, when asked me, hey, you know, what, what, what do you see about Washington's defense? Like, well, Blake Corum hasn't exactly been a like world beater in the sense that he's got, I believe, like a 4.5, 4.6 yard per carry average. But a lot of that is because he'll have one or two big runs in like the second half of a game. You know, kind of like, He'll get his three yards in a cloud of dust for most of the game. And then that total, that average total, would have jump because he has some like 50, 60 yarder, which again is what Washington can't afford to have. You can give up right. the threes, you can give up the fours, you can even give up the eights, the tens, and the twelves. But getting gashed into that second and third level to Washington is going to be what determines defensively whether they win this game or not. Because this defensive line has proven, especially against Oregon in the Pac 12 championship game, that. We actually can play. We can hang with these guys. Now, again, the separator there is Bo Nix. Can can JJ McCarthy use his legs as much, you know, like like Bo Nix did? Because Quinn Ewers could, right? right? And that was kind of a key separator. Because if you and that showed too, that showed like when when every time that Quinn Ewers decided to run the ball, there was nobody anywhere near him. I feel like it. Sorry, I I just want to get this in there because I feel like it will will be a little bit more. there, there'll, there'll be a little bit more concern when it comes to J.J. McCarthy's legs versus Quinn Ewers. But sorry, sorry, continue. I just want to throw that in there. No, but, that, but that's a good point because, because again, as you said, it, when he did run, it was open season. It was open country. So, like, yeah. like and, and it gets a better running quarterback in J.J. Again, J.J. McCarthy is no, you know, Mike Vick or uh, who's a good running quarterback. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of a quarterback that runs in that same mold. But can Justin think Fields, Jalen well, Hurts, well, yeah. Well, well, well. well I was going to say like bone inch, right? We have bigger sure. bone inch, right? But, you know, because the other thing that's similar to Bo is they are a high percentage passing team, right? So it's the simple thing, not the simple dink and dunks, but it's like JJ McCarthy isn't put in a bad position to make a bad throw. It's now imperative for Washington to put him behind the sticks. So if you're able to control, again, not, not contain, right? But just kind of you know, sure. control, you know, the amount of big runs that Blake Corum is able to have and set Michigan back in the third and five, third and eight, third and 10, or even potentially longer, that's how Washington at least not just hangs around in this game, but actually could take control of this game. And that starts with Braylon Trice. It starts with ZTF off the edge, getting pressure. But just as imperatively, it starts with Fatui, Tuatele, MJLA, and, and Tuli Tuli Gassano up the middle, making sure those guys can get home. Because as we've seen plenty of times this year, the pass rush can get there. Braylon tries and ZTF and, and Boy and all those guys can come in on the outside. But then that pocket kind of you know collapses and opens up and the quarterback just runs straight down the field for 15 to 20. That to me is how Michigan combats it because sure. Jason McCarthy, as you said, can run. So Washington having maybe not a spy because, again, you don't view him like Bo Nix where you know he's going to run but you need to have that safety linebacker kind of just keeping an extra eye on him, knowing he can run. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And I know that's something that Washington's defense has struggled with this season, where we saw Caleb Williams be able to make a lot of plays with his legs. Bo Nix, especially in the first game, did that really well. He had a couple, he had that one big run in the second game too. And it's it showed up at other points, right? Noah Fafita, Taylor Green. The, the list goes on of mobile quarterbacks that were able to find a way to 
I don't want to use the term expose, but just find a way to to gain gain big yardage against this defense on the ground. So I I'm I'm going to be really curious to watch that because playing off of that, it does feel like Washington seems to trust their secondary. I know the numbers necessarily aren't there to to back it up, but Washington definitely trusts their secondary in single coverage. And it's something that uh, Greg McElroy talked about yesterday where he said, I feel like Washington's defense has gotten to the point where it's underrated because when you have to play Arizona, USC, Oregon twice, some of these teams that can throw the ball all over the place, the numbers on defense are going to be a little inflated. Washington has had more pass attempts on them than any other team in the country. So those numbers are going to be a little bit higher than, you know, it would be for some other defenses. And one matchup that I'm going to be watching very closely is Jabbar Muhammad versus Roman Wilson where Jabbar was excellent in the Sugar Bowl. He locked down Xavier Worthy and did a tremendous job throughout that game. So I'm really curious to see what he can do in this moment on this stage and just in in, in this massive game because it feels like they're going they because they've done it all year. They trust him out on an island. Just leave him in single coverage. Just, just say go to work. We we believe in you. And he's delivered every single time. So I I'm, I'm really curious to see how that goes for him. And then on top of that, another guy that I talked to yesterday at media day was Javon Parker, where I asked him what stands out, especially you know him being a, a guy from Detroit. Just I, I wanted to get his perspective on all this. And I said, what do, what have you guys seen on film from Michigan's offensive line? And one of the things he told me was that. When they're working in tandem, they're a fantastic team. They coordinate really well. They communicate. They're really good at just knowing where to be. And but and then he said, but on top of that, I feel like when we get into some one-on-one scenarios, where, whether it be with speed or with power, that we can find a way to win some of those matchups and get some pressure in the backfield. So I, the, the, they clearly have a plan of attack up there. My question is, how are you going to execute it, and can you do it effectively? Right. And I mean, I think that that almost kind of seems symbolic in both sides of the ball. We're like, I think they can scheme up a great game. Can the players execute it? I think the offense certainly sure. can. I think the defense, we've, we've heard of the times this season where the players would say, hey, you know, it's pretty complicated back here. You know, we kind of got like five or six different things working. I think the one thing that I'll be intrigued is how simplistic, but yet still detailed is the game plan from Chuck Morrell, right? Because on right. one hand, Michigan's offense pretty pretty simple in in the concept of obviously stop the run and then kind of contain Jason McCarthy. Roman Wilson is a fantastic receiver, but as I said on a couple of other shows, Washington's three are better than any of Michigan's ones, and that's not that's no sure. slight to Roman Wilson, but Roman Wilson is wide receiver probably four or five on this team. You know, like, sure. And again, that, that's no disrespect to Roman Wilson, but I think even Michigan would say. Would you take any of Washington's receivers over your one? They're saying, yeah, g- give me any of them. Yes, yes, like eight, t- 10 out of 10 times. So for me, it's a matter of can, you know, don't does the game plan set the team back or does the game plan kind of allow for ambiguity to where, okay, once you start to feel the game out, how much can you change every, right? Can you adapt the game plan in, in game? And then to honestly, Chuck Merrill's credit, which he doesn't get enough of, that's one thing he's really excelled at in the back half of the season is making those in-game adjustments. Yes. Right? Finding those, oh, hey, okay, now we go in even before halftime. I'm like, hey, okay, this is what we're doing. We're just going to scrap that. We're going to go this. And then they come out in the second half, and it's, oh, okay, cool. It's almost like, not, not that the seatbelt is taken off, but it's kind of like you, know, you loosen it up a little bit to where, okay, now I can still do this comfortably, and I know exactly what I need to do, and I'm not going to be put in a bad position. Whereas, you know, in certain other games this season, when you would say, oh, hey, there's a big running game. Oh, there's, they're making big plays in the secondary. It's like, well, yeah, it's because they're still working some kinks out. So I feel like one great example of that that actually kind of fits really well, where not in terms of like personnel, because Michigan has far superior personnel on, on every level, is the Utah game. When it comes to the adjustments, the scheme, and everything that happened, where Washington gave up 27 points in the first half went horrible on defense against one of the worst offenses in the country. And then they go in at halftime, make some adjustments and they come out and give up 75 total yards in the second half, no points. And they find a way to come back and win that game where it's exactly, as you said, that's just kind of what this defense has done this season. So you can't just look at the numbers and say, Oh, this is a bad defense because that's not true. Is it a great defense? No. We've we've said that all season long, and I know we, we've we've had some detractors say, "Oh, well, this needs to change or that needs to change." They've still done enough to get to this point. Now, now they're here. Now they're in the national championship. So it doesn't necessarily matter what else goes on. 
they they found a way to get to this point. Now you just need to execute and find a way to make that one big play one more time. Yep, exactly. And I think that 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 to me, and I think that's kind of why we have so much faith in Washington is because they've done it time and time again. Again, now against you know Oregon, fairly decent similar competition. Texas, obviously, they led the entire game, so they didn't have to really fight for that. But again, all of these have been four quarter games. Michigan has been in a handful, but. Again, I know it's the cliche, but it's like Washington truly is built for this. Right. Washington, has, they, they've been underdogs in four of their last five games. We just talked about it the other day. And that's 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 just one one of the things that has helped to get to that moment. And I'm not we're not saying that Michigan hasn't had to overcome things and hasn't had to play really great football to get to this point. But wa- the way Washington's schematics have worked and the way that they have found a way through their coaching staff to get to this point just – it, there, it just it feels like there's something there for this team that's helped them get there. All right, Lars, let's let's get into our bold predictions. Let's have a little fun here. Right after we send a, a message to our friends over at Jace Medical, I know we come to to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of real life, but can we just talk about a minute for preparing for real life? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. This is scary. I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than if any of my family or any of my friends just got sick while a supply chain issue kept them from the life-saving medication they need. Thankfully, we'll be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, uh, sinuses, skin infections, among others, this stuff could happen to any of us. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use code offer code locked on to get twenty dollars off your first purchase. All right, Lars, it's time for bold predictions, and as is as it's tradition. I, I forgot. I kind of think it was me this time because I know I said the exact same thing last time, but I can't remember. So I'm just going to give you the floor here. That works for me. I mean, I think there's so many, there's, there's so many, you know, and interestingly enough, by the way, FanDuel now has it at five and a half. So again, Oh, interesting. You know, but, but if you go on ESPN, they have it at four. So, I mean, choose your books wisely, but I still, I still would take watch that time. Washington can again lose this game by three, and both those bets still cover. If sure. you take plus four and a half, plus four, plus five, or five and a half. So to me, let's, I'm going to start out with um, Michael Penix, which again, kind of to me, this is an interesting one because when you look at his odds, most of them for 275, 275 yards or fewer, he's a lock. But then they start to question, can he actually get to 300? And I'm looking at this and I see, okay, well. Michigan hasn't allowed more than 247, 271 yards passing, which came against Ohio State. Penix is better than Ohio State. This offense, and again, I understand that Michigan created this team to combat Ohio State, but Ohio State, the scheme is different. It's a right. similar concept that you have an NFL quarterback and three NFL receivers. That's kind of some comp that people would give me. So I'm going to say Michael Penix throws for at least 350. Because okay. again, if Was- so that's Washington, a big number, if Was- but again, like that's what's kind of funny. Like if you go look at the Sugar Bowl numbers, and then it's like, oh yeah, Penix does actually normally throw for three fifty or four hundred yards. Like it was kind of a weird season where he, he is going to probably set the passing record in school history again, breaking his own record from last season. And he did it with honestly three fewer games because again, Arizona State, Stanford, and. There's one other one where he Stanford. Kind of, he was pretty good. It was the Oregon State would be a big or, one. Or Oregon State, but Arizona State, Oregon State. Those two combined, that's two games where he doesn't have. But yet he still is about to break the record. So for me, give me Michael Penix three plus three hundred fifty yards, and I'm going to say four touchdowns. Four to all right. The, see, the, it's the national championship. It's all about the bold predictions. You're getting bold. I love it. I'm here for it. So I'm going to go a, a little. Oh yeah. The, with, with the archer. Oh, this is, this is perfect. We're, we're having some fun here. So I'm going to go, it, it's bold because you'll always get good numbers from the, from the betting markets on this one. Give me Dylan Johnson, two plus touchdowns. We saw him do it in the PAC 12 championship game. We saw him do it in the sugar bowl. Michigan's got a better running defense than 
uh, I, I'll give them better than Oregon. I don't know about better than Texas because that that run defense came to play as as we yeah. saw. I know yeah. we we doubted them a little bit, but they really came to play. But that that doesn't mean that he can't have two short yardage touchdowns because that's exactly what we saw early on in that game. We've seen it time and time and time again where they get inside the five yard line. They just say, "All right, Dylan, here you go." Where that that seems like it's an easy enough one where it's it's still bold because you're going to get pretty good odds when, when you go two plus touchdowns on anybody. Exactly. When I think of it, and to your point, if you're Washington, the yardage doesn't matter. It's the attempts and touchdowns that matter because sure. can, you, can you offset Michael Penix enough and can you score when we need you to? Like that's the whole reason you brought a bulldozer like Dylan Johnson in the program where if you don't have Cam Davis to punch it in, somebody else has to. Otherwise, Penix is now throwing alley-oops from the one-yard line and or, you know, doing the touch push and potentially injuring himself. So I think right. that's exactly the role that Dylan Johnson plays. I am going to go – now we got to get a little more creative here because there's so <laughs> many – if you think about oh, – which receiver do I want to take? I am going to take – you know, give me, give me Jalen Polk. Wow. Wow. Okay. The FanDuel odds really favor you for – so plus 60 – so Jalen Polk just needs to get to 60 yards or more to, to hit for his alt-receiving alt yards. So I'm going to say 110 yards, seven catches, and at least one touchdown. I want to say two, but I'm going to say at least one touchdown for Jalen Polk. So I, I like this because I went on, on Texas football last week before the, uh, before the Sugar Bowl, and I gave them a parlay. I said, just give me Jalen Polk's over under on receiving yards. Give me the over at 52 and a half plus Washington four and a half. I hope some people took my advice on that one because that bet, betting on Jalen Polk has become a, a fun one to have here. So I like that. You're, you're getting really big and really bold, which I, I think is really fun. I'm I'm going to take just the, the little, just a little bit of the, the, the tone down angle today. Uh, but this this is tough because I want to do one more offensive one here, and I want to do an anytime touchdown. Just to just to stick with the tradition here, and I you know what I, I gave him a shout out early on in the show. I'm going to go with Jack West over anytime touchdown. I I think that he's going to find a way to we because we've seen Quentin Moore show up in a big spot with the tight end there, where the tight ends haven't necessarily found their way into the end zone a whole ton. Where we saw Jack West over have his three touchdown game uh, in all of the first half against Michigan State. And, we haven't really seen him score a lot since then. So give me Jack West over to show up at a big spot anytime touchdown. I like that. So I, I since I already gave a couple touchdown predictions, obviously the Polk one and, and Penix, I'm gonna stick with the guy that came in clutch for me at the end of la, at the end of the Sugar Bowl. Give me Grady Gross over Ooh. six and a half points. Because again, if you think about it, five touchdowns, you already got five. That usually yeah. one field goal. I like this. You're you're playing all off each other here. You're, you're you're just building like just one one nice betting slip. So I like that a lot. I'm gonna flip over to the defensive side here, where I I want to take somebody else than Braylon Trice. Just have like the the over on half a sack. And you know what? In his swan song, give me Tuli Latuli Gasanoa. I think that you'd get great odds on that if you're if you're looking on FanDuel or anywhere else. But give me Thule over half a sack. The guy has had a fantastic career. It is the final game of his six-year Husky career. And to send him out on top, because I, I assume I know where you're going to go here with your with your score prediction when we get to it. But to send him out on top, I think he's going to have a fantastic game. I think that he knows exactly what he needs to do to bring home a national championship. I wrote about that a, a little over on Inside the Husky, so make sure you go check that out. But... Give me Thule over half a sack. I I I think that he's gonna have a huge day. I like it. I mean, uh, so so are we not doing any uh, total tackle record? here? Oh, that was gonna be my last one. Yeah, that, that, oh, that, that's oh, okay. Okay, good. Okay, so, so I, I okay, I, try, I just I didn't want to take that if you were gonna say no. That. I got you. Um, um, so let me. Oh, what do I want to do? Because for me, obviously Braylon's gonna cook. The question is, is there a turnover in this game and who forces it? Because I feel right. like if Penix gets picked, there's a drive killer. We saw, obviously, what two turnovers did against Texas. Again, it only resulted in a Grady Ghost field goal, but still, nevertheless, that's an important three points right there. So I'm going to say Washington's defense forces two and a half. I'll put the over under at one and a half turnovers, and I would take the over, so two turnovers. Okay. And 
here, here's a bold prediction that's not so bold because history tells me that it's I'm, history is on my side with this. And I mentioned this before on the podcast. There, I don't. I, I don't know who it will be, right? I can't go too bold. Sure. I mean, I can say Jeremy Bernard. I can say Daniel and Gata because those are the most likely two. Washington will have a special teams touchdown in the national. Oh, season. that's that would be huge. Because, that that because because the one thing that Kalen DeBoer has said that has come with every single national championship is a special teams touchdown. So somehow, some way, it could be a blocked punt that is returned for a touchdown. That is a sure. special teams touchdown. So Roman Dunes, I could cook. Maybe Jeremy Bernard gets his redemption from allowing the touchdown, or you know, the, the boss that sets up Texas to touchdown in the Sugar Bowl. There's plenty. Daniel God is also really good on kickoff. So I don't know. That to me, if Washington wins this game, somebody's got to score on special teams. I that you're you're getting extra bold today, and I like it. So I'll give you one last one. I'm not gonna go leading tackler. I'm gonna go just some. I I I have a tackle prop here for. I'm gonna go with Asa Turner. I was torn between the two safeties, but, and you know, I know Asa's 50, 50 about coming back for next season, but if, if the Huskies find a way to win this game, I think that, you know, he might just say, all right, I got to go out on top here. So give me a big game from Asa Turner. I'm going to set his over on, I'm going to set it high. I'm going to say over under six and a half total tackles from him and give me the over. I mean, I like that total though, because right, I mean, he's not going to have eight, nine, or ten. So, no. and also, if he does, that means there's a problem because, right? <laughs> I mean, let's just be real. I mean, Blake Corum got past the first and second line one too many times. Um, yeah, I mean, the secondary is going to have to play a result no matter what. So, Asa and it, Asa was the one that forced the fumble against Texas, right? Yes, was, one uh, of them. Yeah, one, one, one right, obviously. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so three one uh, drum roll. Yep, yeah. it's time for the the final one, the national championship score prediction. What do you got for us? So, as I said at the start of the season, I was the only one on our site that picked Washington to win the national championship. I have not bet against Washington this season. My confidence level for this pick is probably fifty one forty nine. Like in terms of, <laughs> you know, I the the matchup to me isn't as good as it was against Texas, right? I had no problem sure. thinking, hey, you know, Washington's gonna win by at least, a, you know, a possession against. It's I was confident in that one. I was one of the few. We, obviously, you were, but I mean, like, I had no problem seeing. I can see Michigan losing, but it's gonna take everything. Thirty-four, thirty, Washington over Michigan. Okay. All right. I, I, the, and you know, Lars, I feel like that's a great place to wrap this one up because let's, let's, let's just stop playing around. It's time to get ready for the national championship. So as always, thank you for being here. Thank you to all the everydayers for tuning in. We really do appreciate your support. Make sure you stay tuned and hit that subscribe button because we will be coming at you live after the game, win or lose. We'll be here to break it all down. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. So you never miss an episode wherever you get your podcast, whether that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple music, Amazon music. We are there. We're everywhere. We're updating this channel every single day with new content. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you hit the like button, leave us a five-star review if you're audio only, and just leave a comment down below. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, I know we've heard from a lot of Michigan fans this week who say these guys are super bold. Hey, that's why we're here. We like to have some fun with it. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will talk to you after the game.